Your book is called Estrogenation, How Estrogenics Are Making You Fat, Sick, and Infertile. Mm -hmm. What are estrogenics? What are the kind of worst offenders when it comes to exposure to estrogenics? Where are these estrogens coming from in our environment? Why should people get their DNA analyzed? Yep, so estrogenics are just chemicals that act like estrogen in our bodies. The problems are numerous because hormones act in our body in a hundred different ways, right? Physical changes on reproductive organs in males. It literally changes the way our brain works. It's a lot of problems. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. We're going to be deep diving estrogenics today on the podcast, artificial hormones and how they're impacting both men and women and our health. Did you know that testosterone rates have plummeted in recent times? This is affecting both men and women. It's affecting our health. And largely speaking, in some ways, we are sicker as a population, especially in America, than we have been in a long time. In addition, fertility rates have also plummeted. Why is that? We're gonna get into all of this and more with Dr. Anthony J. Dr. Anthony J. is a researcher and author. He used to work with Mayo Clinic. He wrote the book, Estrogeneration, How Estrogenics Are Making You Fat, Sick, and Infertile. And he is also a consultant to help people understand their unique genetic code and what the implications are for them, for their diet and their lifestyle to maximize their health. I hope you'll find this conversation fascinating. I know I did and I learned a lot. Honestly, it was a little bit scary learning some of the facts about all of these toxins in our environment, but Dr. J has some great advice for how we can take this information and make our knowledge powerful to make our lives better in the choices that we make for what we buy, consume and expose our bodies to. As always, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already to the podcast. Also, if you've been listening on podcast apps for some time on Spotify or on Apple, or this is your first episode, please give us five stars. That helps the podcast reach more people. Also leave us a note. I love getting your guys' reviews. Thanks so much for doing that. And don't forget to join our Patreon. Our Patreon is where people can come behind the show and help us make more episodes. You can go to our Patreon at the link in the bio, and you'll also get access to some behind the scenes stuff, including some extra live streams that we're we're going to be doing just for our Patreon subscribers. Dr. Anthony J, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. So for those that don't know your work, you're a PhD, you work with Mayo Clinic. You're also a best-selling author. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, yeah. So I went to Ave Maria University and got a biology degree and a theology degree. <laughs> and then I ended up in Boston working on Alzheimer's for a few years, Alzheimer's disease research, did a PhD, transitioned actually switched gears and did a PhD in the, on the topic of cholesterol and sex hormones. And while I was researching that, I kind of bumped into these chemicals that act like estrogen in our bodies, but it's artificial estrogen, right? It's synthetic. It's not natural. Mm. And BPA is a good example. And of course, a lot of people at that time had heard about BPA. And a lot of people don't realize even today, Lila, that BPA was developed as birth control. In the 1920s, there was a researcher named Charles Edward Dodds, D-O-D-D-S, Dodds. And he literally invented BPA from DES, which is diethylstilbestrol, but he made it for birth control, right? And then they assured everybody it doesn't leach into the water and we, they, they learned how to make plastic out of BPA and told everybody it doesn't leach. Of course, we know that's not true now. But then when they, when they changed gears, they started using a bunch of other synthetic chemicals that also act like estrogen in our body. So as you can imagine, that was problematic. I didn't want to be exposed to a bunch of estrogen chemicals. And it kind of opened my eyes, but then it took me down this path of, you know, Oh, this chemical acts like estrogen too. And this chemical acts like estrogen and there's sunscreen chemicals and there's personal care fragrance chemicals. And, you know, and then I ended up writing a book on it. <laughs> and your book is called Estrogeneration, How Estrogenics Are Making You Fat, Sick and Infertile. Very cheerful title mm -hmm. there. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. What are estrogenics? Give people the rundown of what that, what that even means. Yep. So estrogenics are just chemicals that act like estrogen in our bodies. So that can be natural estrogen, right? Like women have natural estrogen, men have natural estrogen, but then there's artificial estrogen chemicals like atrazine, which is a herbicide. It's the second most used herbicide in North America. Actually mm -hmm. there's, you know, and in fact, atrazine, if you want to give animals PCOS polycystic ovarian syndrome in a research study, you just give them atrazine, you know, like if you're studying rats, 
they don't just get polycystic ovarian syndrome. You have to give it to them. And then you develop drugs for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And they give it to them with atrazine. It's crazy, right? It's like, well, let's just make it. Europe made it illegal. Wow. I think it should be illegal in, in America. Yeah. The herbicide should be illegal in America. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Atrazine. Atrazine. Wow. I think a bunch of these chemicals. Yeah. <laughs> mm hmm. Wow. So walk us through what are some of the ill effects of estrogenics in our environment on the human body, both for men and for women? Yeah, good question. I mean, it's very holistic. The problems are numerous because hormones act in our body in a, in a hundred different ways, right? But the most common problems you see for men, in my opinion, is male feminization. I talk a lot about male feminization because if if we're exposing ourselves constantly with these estrogen mimicking chemicals, it literally changes the way our brain works. According to animal research, you can see brain changes. You see sexual apathy uh, and just general apathy. You see, again, feminization. I mean, you f physical changes on reproductive organs in males, a lot of problems. And again, I wrote about that in my book in 2017. It's becoming more obvious now and more people are picking up on it with the microplastics and everything else. But that's a problem for males. For females, you see a lot of infertility. Oftentimes you see depression. I mean, basically think of like postpartum depression, right? When you disrupt your natural hormones and they take a big swing, it tends towards depression. You see that with a bunch of artificial estrogen chemicals, even in children. In fact, when they're, when they find higher levels of estrogen mimicking chemicals in their urine, you find higher levels of depression in children and children shouldn't even have depression. So, you know, there's a lot of health problems, uh, anything related to hormones. I mean, weight gain is a big one, right? Because, uh, just like in natural pregnancy, when women get pregnant, you store more fat, which is actually a positive thing because fat is an efficient storage form for energy. So it sounds like a negative thing, right? In our culture, but your body stores more fat when you become pregnant for energy in case there's a starvation period or something. Uh, and now we don't have those starvation periods, but the problem is these artificial estrogen chemicals mimic that process and they, they communicate to your body to store more fat. So most people don't appreciate that. And, and of course, like birth control, that's one of the side effects, right? Weight gain is one of the side effects. And, and by the way, of course, artificial estrogens in birth control are artificial estrogens. And I wrote about that too. Um, and they're found in the drinking water. It's not just people taking pills. It's literally people urinating out this stuff, going into the water supply and not getting filtered out. How has our water been impacted by estrogen? What's, what, are the, what are the statistics on that or are there studies on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll give you an example from atrazine, right? We we're talking about atrazine earlier, the second most used herbicide in North America, which acts like estrogen. Um, the legal allowable limit, the safety limit from the government, from the EPA is 3000 nanograms per liter. Just remember the number 3000. If you have a frog, a male frog in atrazine, it turns female at 200 nanograms per liter, 200, 3000 wow. is the limit in our drinking water frogs. You get a male to female transition with 200. So you see it in animals, right? You see this where there's wastewater. You see there this in areas where they spray atrazine. You see it in fish. Uh, you see it in alligators. You see it all over the place. And of course, in humans too, I think we see this also, unfortunately. But again, it's not just the atrazine. It's the plastics. It's the personal care products. And it's not hopeless, by the way. You got to filter your drinking water. I think that's one of the most important things. Like, I think people need to filter the drinking water. The government is good at killing viruses, killing bacteria, using chemicals to, you know, make the water safe. So it's not killing you and you're not getting infections from water, but they're terrible at filtering these estrogen mimicking chemicals. So you have to do it yourself. Do, do we know how much estrogen, how, how, what is the, I guess the, the load of estrogen mimicking chemicals in your average water from the tap in your average city? Do we have numbers on that or studies on that? Yep. Um, sometimes, I mean, they do isolated studies. The EWG is a good reference because they have a tap water database. Have you ever seen that tap water database? Mm -mm. 
Yeah, you can put in your zip code. So you go to you just type in three letters E W G, and then tap water database, and then you type in your zip code, and it'll tell you the chemicals that are above the government safety limit in your water. So in South Dakota, where I live, there are no chemicals above the safety limit where I just happen to be. Uh, but in Minnesota, where I used to live across the border, uh, I, ha I think I had eight chemicals above the safety limit. Whoa. And so I know, and I've got children, you know, taking baths and the babies are drinking water and stuff. I used to filter the water coming into my house, but you know, for sure filter drinking water. So that's a good start, right? Like look up the EWG tap water database but also just assume there's a lot of plastic piping and a lot of contamination with estrogens coming into your house. What about testosterone? My understanding is that testosterone rates in men have plummeted. What is the latest data yep. on that? And what is that? Why is that happening? And also, what does it mean for the men? How does it affect them? Yeah, so definitely the testosterone rates are plummeting. I have a friend in, in Miami, he runs a hormone replacement clinic for men. And he, 20 years ago, he said they didn't even accept males below age 40. It wasn't even an option. He said once a year, they would get a request for a man who has low testosterone. And now literally 80% of his clients are, uh, he's got hundreds of clients, right? And 80% are under the age of 40 with low testosterone. And the problem, the medical community has, has basically adopted low testosterone as normal. So they've lowered the normal range, Lila. Like basically in the 1980s, the normal range was 500 to 1500 for men. And now they've lowered it down to like 250 to 1000. So in other words, they've just, they've just, and this is happening with puberty, by the way, for girls, because girls are going into puberty at younger ages because of all these estrogen chemicals. So they're trying to lower the normal range for puberty and just say it's okay it's normal it's not normal it shouldn't be normalized but they're trying to make it accepted as a normal thing by lowering the range and they've done this with testosterone and by the way women have testosterone did you know women's testosterone is higher than estrogen their entire lives wow we have women actually have more testosterone than men and throughout their whole lives, right? And so this affects women too. It's not just altering estrogen in women, it's altering their testosterone levels also. And I've seen a lot of cases where, you know, women get on testosterone replacement. I'm not recommending women take levels that are similar to men's levels, but they have testosterone and it's an important hormone, especially after menopause when it declines even more. And it's very protective against depression. Um, it, it, it just gives people more energy. It helps you heal so you can go to the gym and exercise more and heal from the, you know, you, your body recovers better when your testosterone is higher for men and women. So it's actually a travesty that women's testosterone is also declining. And the real travesty is not a lot of people are studying that. They're studying men. And that's very clear in the research. And I outline all this in my book. In fact, we go all the way back to the paleo times because we have bone records and you can see you know, test, you can estimate testosterone based on bone structures and bone records from the paleo times. And it's really gone down if you compare ourselves to those ancestors. That's insane. Okay, so what are the practical implications then of low testosterone rates? Let's start with men. Obviously, people point to sex drive. Your sex drive is lower when your testosterone is lower. Mm -hmm. What else though? What are the other implications for men? So less muscle mass, uh, more depression, uh, less energy, more apathy, less bone density. And again, that affects women too. Um, there's a lot of things. It's, it's almost a good measure of health in general. If your testosterone mm -hmm. is high, that generally means you're healthy. If your testosterone is low, that generally means something's off. Like you're probably not sleeping as good. You might be stressed out. You might not be eating healthy. You know, so testosterone is almost a blood test that gives you a good indication of overall health. Um, yeah. What are, the, what are the factors that contribute to low testosterone besides estrogenics? So uh, you mentioned not sleeping enough. So, you know, I'm just trying to imagine for the modern man today, testosterone rates are plummeting. Clearly estrogenics have something to do with that. We're gonna explore that more in a minute. But are there other factors at play here too, having to do with just the modern environment that we live in and the way we behave. Yeah, I think so for sure. I mean, 
circadian rhythm disruption, you know, with all the blue lights and all the, you know, the light pollution and things, looking at our phones right before we go to bed, basically like poor sleep leads to poor testosterone, poor nutrients, you know, nutrient deficiencies leads to poor testosterone for men and women. And that's a common problem, I think, especially with magnesium. I think a lot of mm -hmm. people have magnesium deficiencies. In fact, I give it to my kids before they go to bed every night. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the few supplements. I don't do a ton of supplements with the kids, but we do magnesium. It's good. It helps you calms your nervous system, helps people sleep. Um, but yeah, it's, it's lack of exercise too. I would say in sunshine, you know, ironically, sunshine, exercise, sleep, and nutrients, pretty basic, but those are all critical for your testosterone. A big thank you to our sponsor, Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is America's meat delivered. Did you know that when you go into the grocery store, up to 90% of the meat, even if it says product of the USA, is not from the USA. It's imported in and then they slap on that label, product of the USA. With Good Ranchers, 100% of the meat, the poultry, the pork, all of it is farmed and raised in the United States. What is so awesome about Good Ranchers is that they're a pro-life, pro-family company that shares your values and sends you absolutely delicious meat. I love their steaks, I love their chicken. Their chicken is delicious and juicy and tender and you're gonna love it too. Right now, Good Ranchers has a special going on where you get $100 off your first order plus a year's supply of free Wagyu burgers. Let me repeat that. You get a year's supply of free Wagyu burgers. That sounds really good. And all you have to do is become a monthly subscriber and get your box of delicious chicken and steaks directly to your door. So go to GoodRanchers.com today, become a subscriber, and get up to $100 off plus a year's worth of free Wagyu burgers. Don't forget to use the code LILA at checkout to get up to $100 off and a full year supply of free Wagyu burgers. That's GoodRanchers.com and use the code LILA at checkout. So the testosterone rates are plummeting. They're worse than they've ever been historically, according to data from, you know, thousands of years ago, even. We were talking about estrogenics. You were mentioning some things about what testosterone, how it's impacted apart from estrogenics. Let's deep dive the estrogenics now. So you mentioned drinking water. What are the different environmental exposures that lead to low testosterone in men? Like where is this, where are these estrogens coming from in our environment besides water? Well, sunscreen is another one. I mean, they put sunscreen chemicals in a lot of personal care products that people don't even realize like shampoos and they brag about it, right? They say, oh, it's, it protects your hair from UV damage, but then your skin actually absorbs these benzene molecules like avobenzene and benzophenones. Um, and they've done a lot of studies on these chemicals and they're very bad. Again, a lot of countries have outlawed them. You know, what's really sad, Lila, is China has stricter laws on these estrogen mimicking chemicals in personal care products than America. And of course, Europe does. Europe has much stricter laws. So personal care is a big one. I think the fragrances are a big problem area, the hotspot. And people need to watch out for those personal care products. What about your phone? What about Wi-Fi? Um, I don't keep it in my pocket. That's for sure. <laughs> All the time. I do. I mean, I, I do put it in airplane mode when I sleep. I keep it away from me at night. Mm. I've looked at the research. Why? I mean, the thing about, yeah, well, because there is some radiation for sure. I have, I'm not an expert on EMFs, electromagnetic radiation, but uh, radiation, like wavelengths decline as you get further away, right? So the further you are from something like that, the better, because there's exponential decline from microwaves and from EMFs. So the further you are from the source, the better. So I think phones are okay. Just, I, I don't recommend people walk around with them in their pocket, especially men. And I recommend don't have them right next to it. I know, I know a guy, he sleeps with his phone under his pillow all night long, I think that's crazy, you know? But I but also don't obsess over his it. Is that affecting his mm -hmm. testosterone levels or what does that affect? How does that inter interplay with estrogenics, if um, at all? I'm not sure. I'm sure it probably affects testosterone. I don't know if there's been a study directly looking at that, like time, hours of exposure versus testosterone declines and things. Um, 
Remember, testosterone is a good marker for overall health. So if your overall health is declining, generally your testosterone is declining. And mm -hmm. if you're being exposed to a lot of radiation, your overall health is generally declining. But whether they've measured that specifically or not, I honestly don't know. I don't think so. So alongside, you're talking about sunscreen, we talked about water. What are some other culprits of exposure to estrogenics? Yeah, so... Oils, you know, people buy oils in plastic jars. I recommend buy them in glass. Like because olive oil. oil is especially, yeah, exactly. And wow. oil is especially, yeah, it absorbs quicker than water with these chemicals uh, because these chemicals are like oil, they're oily. So yeah, in general, I try and promote glass or stainless steel or silicone over plastics, just across the board, you know, especially if there's liquids, if there's liquids involved, try and go with silicone, glass, stainless steel. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy because so mm -hmm. much of what we buy is in plastic. Uh, you know, you go to the grocery store, water is in plastic, fruit is packaged often in plastic bags. Obviously, all of the stuff in the frozen food section is in pretty much plastic, even if it's in the pizza boxes and then the plastic wrap inside the pizza box. Um, you know, your rice is in plastic your peanut butter's in plastic, everything's in plastic. You can't avoid it, I guess is what I'm saying. Are there some food items or drinks that are in plastic are less leach? You know, there's less leaching that's happening and where you're end ultimately ingesting the estrogen estrogenics or is it really all bad? What, what would you advise? <laughs> what do you do at the grocery store, Dr. J to protect your, protect your family? Um, well, we buy a whole cow from a farmer that we know, you know, and I have a chest Seriously? freezer and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, well I have five kids, right? But are you but, wrapping um, the cow up in plastic before you put them in the deep freezer? Yeah, good question. I actually have them wrap in butcher paper instead of plastic, wow. so I request that specifically. Um, and it's wax, it's not plas lined with plastic, mm -hmm. it's lined with wax. Exactly, and I also, I, I also use plastic for those vacuum sealers. But when I do hamburger meat, I do use butcher paper first, and then I put the plastic vacuum sealer bags, mm -hmm. and I do it. So I do, there is plastic inevitably, and it's okay if you're getting a little plastic contact. The nice thing about meat is it's a solid, right? It's not a liquid, so you get a lot less leaching. When there's liquid, it's just constant molecular movement and leaching, so it's a bigger problem. And that's a general principle, right? Like if there's something that's solid, like bread in plastic, you're not going to get leaching. But olive oil, you're going to get a lot of leaching, so choose mm -hmm. glass when it comes to liquids across the board. And I don't buy juices and things generally, so I just filter my drinking water, and I'm good with liquids in that regard. And then, of course, vegetables and things like that. There's no leaching, even if they're covered in plastics. In any given man who's affected by estrogenics, what would you say the percentages are? How much of his, the effect on his testosterone is coming from his water he's drinking versus it's coming from, you know, the fresh fruits he's eating that are maybe sprayed with herbicides that have estrogenics. Like, do you have any sense of what is, you know, what are the kind of worst offenders when it comes to exposure to estrogenics, particularly for men? Yeah, I mean, I always tell people fragrances and drinking water, you know, I mean, those are the most common everyday sources. And if you're buying conventional foods, you're going to get into pesticides and herbicides, um, you know, sprayed on the grains in particular, the grains are the most notorious sources in terms of pesticides and herbicides, mm. but yeah, those are the big three. And grains, I was talking with my husband recently about oats. Apparently there's some study that oats in particular, like your average oatmeal, unless it's organic has a high load of, I think estrogenics in it. Is that the case? And what would you recommend when it comes with breakfast cereals? Yeah, well, me personally, I just do eggs, you know, like <laughs> I try and avoid carbs in the morning for the even for the kids and we just do eggs. Um, but yeah, organic is certainly better than conventional with all the grains. Um, and, you know, this whole problem, this whole idea that cholesterol is the the ultimate em enemy of our health and high cholesterol is bad and all this. A lot of that is just marketing for drug companies. Honestly, mm -hmm. cholesterol is the building block for your sex hormones. A lot of people don't realize like 
our testosterone, our estrogen, our progesterone, those are all made from cholesterol. So it's actually wow. important to have nice high levels of cholesterol, not outrageously high levels, but nice high levels to the point where they'll actually flag your cholesterol and tell you it's high when it's not actually high. This has become a real problem. Just like we mentioned earlier how they've lowered the normal range for testosterone, they've actually lowered the normal range for cholesterol. So they flag you when you're not really high, but they tell you they're, that you're high. So like, for example, Lila, in the 1980s, it used to be normal. If your cholesterol was below 300, that was considered normal. But now they've lowered that range all the way down to 200. So if you get above 200 on your cholesterol on your blood test, they tell you that it's too high. And that was that happened in 1987 when they invented the first statin. So they modified that normal range when they did, invented statins. And again, Why? the problem with people thinking, because they sell more drugs, right? If, they, if everybody thinks they have high cholesterol, then they take drugs. Everybody's on statins, you know, so they make billions of dollars. And the problem with that is, number one, your cholesterol is important for hormones. And number two, then you suddenly think bacon is bad for you or you think red meat is bad for you and things like that. There's all these conclusions that are out, kind of silly and outrageous um, that people draw because, yeah, red meat raises your cholesterol. Who cares? Your cholesterol is fine, right, for the most for most people. Now, there's exceptions, but, you know, I think some, some of that's important also. A huge thank you to our sponsor, Seven Weeks Coffee. Sevenweekscoffee.com is a delicious gourmet coffee company that does small batch ethically sourced roasts of coffee just for you, and they deliver it right to your door. They have all kinds of roasts. I love their Ethiopian medium roast. If you like the dark roast, they have them, the light roast, they have them, the espresso roast, they have them. And what I love about Seven Weeks Coffee as a longtime partner with this show is that they support the pro-life movement and give 10% back of all their revenue to the pro-life movement, giving that directly to pregnancy care centers that help babies and moms in need. So when you order from sevenweekscoffee.com, you're not only drinking a delicious cup of coffee at the beginning of your day, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. And if you join their Heartbeat Club and you become a monthly subscriber and you get their coffee to your door every month, you can get up to 25% off your first order using the code LILA at checkout. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and get up to 25% off your first order using the code LILA at checkout. So what are the, uh, what would you recommend as far as diets to maximize health, particularly hormone levels, uh, to balance them, improve them for men and for women? I know there's obviously the paleo diet, there's the carnivore diet, um, Mediterranean diet, as long as your olive oil, I guess, is not in plastic. What's your take on the, the healthiest diet yeah, well, one of the for the healthiest body? I do DNA consulting is because everybody's a little bit different. And so everybody's genes are a little different. So there's obviously variation. And of course, kids are different than adults because kids have a real high metabolism. So in general, most adults, I recommend intermittent fasting because our ancestors mm -hmm. clearly were fasting. It's better for most people's metabolism. It's better for all kinds of different processes. Uh, but again, children, it's different. Um, and sometimes women struggle to intermittent fast around their period. So I oftentimes don't recommend it during certain times of the month, but then the rest of the month I recommend it. So there's a lot of nuance here, but again, generally I personally skip breakfast and then at lunchtime I try and eat zero carb. If, if I eat carbs at lunch, and this is true of most people, you feel tired all afternoon, right? And so generally I'm pretty keto at lunch. And then at dinner time, I actually have carbs. Um, and I'm not opposed to carbs, but at dinner time, that's when I bring them in. And that works pretty well for a lot of people. If they go skip breakfast, zero carb lunch, carbs at dinner, just as a general rule. And then all the other nuances. Yeah, you have to work those out. And, and why is that? Why is a carb load first thing in the morning, not good for people's health? And you know, ironically, that's what the American standard diet is. It's right. Start your day with a bagel or a big bowl of cereal. And yep. that's what we grew up doing. And that's what, you know, this recommended to us, even the FDA, I think food pyramid is like, you know, all of these carbs that they recommend, you know, with every meal, why is that not the best path? Yeah. Um, the problem with starting your day on carbs is then you get hungry every three hours. So then you eat breakfast at six, you're hungry at nine, you're hungry at noon, you're hungry at three, you're hungry at six, you're hungry at 9 p.m. So it turns you into like this vicious cycle of eating every three hours. And that's because your, your insulin is spiking and then it's crashing and it's spiking and it's crashing. So you just keep getting hungry and you want more snacks. 
and then you end up just burning sugar for energy. Your body has two energy sources. You're either burning sugar or you're burning fats. That's it. Those are the two energy sources. And if you teach your body to burn sugar for energy by just constantly eating carbs, it's very dirty energy. Basically, sugar burning is like a diesel truck. You know how there's like black smoke coming out the back on the diesel truck? If you're burning fats for energy, it's very clean energy. It's like a Tesla. So you kind of want your body to burn fats. You don't want to go zero carb all the time. That's kind of stressful for your body. But you don't want to have carbs constantly throughout the day either. So eating breakfast that's high carb puts you on that vicious cycle of just crashing your insulin and craving carbs all the time. And remember... Insulin is a fat storage hormone. If, you're, if your insulin is high, it's telling your body to store more fat, store more fat, store more fat. So insulin is not something you want to have high. How do you balance your insulin? By just not eating a ton of carbs all the time. Tough. <laughs> I know, they're addictive. Uh, well, they're literally addictive. <laughs> yeah, they're so good. And, um, in, in a bad way, I guess. Okay, carnivore diet, you mentioned, you know, it's not necessarily good to just totally cut the carbs. Obviously, some people do carnivore diets, so it's increasingly popular, and there have been some, you know, stories of people saying how it just totally changed their life. You know, I have a girlfriend, as an example, she recently went carnivore, lost 30 pounds, no more brain fog, she's in the best health of her life, you know, and I hear these stories, and I'm like, oh, should we try, you know, what, what is this? What is your take on that? Is that, is that a path to long-term health, too? Are there going to be health side effects we hear about in the next decade from people who went carnivore, and they're like, oh, goodness, this was actually really bad for us in the long term? Yeah, I've, I'm friends with Sean Baker. I've been on his podcast and Paul Saladino. I've been on their both of their podcasts and they're both carnivore. Um, it fits certain people's genetics. So I always go back to genetics because I do genetic consulting, but it fits mm -hmm. certain people's DNA. It doesn't fit others. Most people don't need to go that extreme um, where they're just eating carnivore. But if, you know, it, it has a good reset, sometimes it's good as a reset temporarily. And sometimes, again, it's good to not be afraid of meat some people are just simply afraid of meat and they've cut meat out and you know they're just bringing more meat back in not going completely carnivore is a good direction it's a good step in the right direction because remember our bodies are made of red meat we're not even chickens right we don't have white meat we have red meat so everything in red meat that your body needs is there right all the creatine all the carnosine all the carnitine all the methionine all that stuff that plants don't make like plants don't have creatine right Plants don't have vitamin B12. It's all found, all those vitamins are found in red meat already. So when you eat that stuff, you do get pretty much all the right nutrients. I want to talk about And it's about gentle your, for your gut. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I've heard everyone talking about those that are doing carnivore, how amazing it is. I've never talked to someone who's done carnivore and hates it or has had a bad experience. So it is an interesting, it is an interesting trend that's increasing in popularity today. Um, what about electrolytes? and um, in water, hmm. how or electrolytes in general. What about electrolytes? How important are they? And what about salt? Yeah, well, first of all, most people, ha if they have high blood pressure, doctors tell them to get off salt. And that's mostly bad advice because almost nobody cures their blood pressure problem by getting off salt. They always still need the medication. In fact, sugar is worse for your blood pressure than salt, right? Because sugar stays in your blood. People's blood sugar is high all the time. That thickens your blood. It's kind of like maple syrup. Mm. And then your body responds by putting more water into your blood, which pressurizes your blood vessels. And that's 24-7. When people eat salt, it comes into your blood, changes your blood pressure for like 10 or 20 minutes, and then it goes out of your blood. It doesn't stay in there and keep it pressurized. So focusing on salt is kind of a red herring. And again, it sells a lot of prescription drugs, so doctors are kind of trained to do that. Now, in terms of um, the, the, the elec taking electrolytes, people taking electrolytes, it depends on your genetics. I know I go back to that a lot, but some people have genes where they urinate out more electrolytes than most people, so they have to take electrolytes as a bigger priority. But then also, if you're eating a lot more fats, you need more electrolytes. It's just the way your body works because when your body stores sugar, it's called glycogen. And sugar, every it's, it's like these big chains of sugar, right? And every molecule of sugar has four water molecules attached to it. So when you, when you store a lot of sugar in your body, you have all this water. And if you start burning that off and start burning fats, you dump a bunch of water into your blood. And then you need more electrolytes. So again 
kind of going keto or fasting has a different requirement for electrolytes than eating a high carb diet. So generally, higher fat diets, more fasting requires more electrolytes. All right, we're going a, a few different directions here, and I want to get to your work about uh, your work understanding one's genetics and how you should how that impacts diet, nutrition, lifestyle. A few more things on the toxic front, though. What about mold? Uh, mold exposure seems to be increasing more and more. I don't know. Buildings are moldy. I don't know why that is, but it, apparently the amount of cases of mold exposure seem to be becoming more. It, it's happening more. Why is that? What's your take on mold exposure? How concerned should we be about it? So mold is ironically particularly bad for you because it disrupts your hormones. And that's what we're talking about. And it's, it's become a bigger problem because it's more common in our food in, from the industrial food processing. You know, we have these giant silos of grains and the government has a legal acceptable limit of mold where they tolerate pretty high levels in America. In Europe, this is crazy, Lila, but animal feed has stricter regulations for mold in Europe than human food in America. Wow. Right? So the grains, the grains they feed their horses have less acceptable amounts of mold than American cereals and things like that. And then, of course, coffee and peanut butter are kind of the, the other two that are notorious for having higher mold. Uh, than a lot of other foods. So grains, coffees, peanut butter. And I think this is where a lot of the peanut peanut sensitivity stuff comes from because it's causing leaky gut. It's causing people's gut lining to develop holes, right? It's it's called intestinal permeability, but most, most people just call it leaky gut. And once your gut is leaking, you've got food particles coming into your bloodstream. Your immune system is panicking and attacking everything, and it causes all kinds of problems. So, you know, obviously, the more industrialized we've become with our food, the more challenging it has become with all the mold that we allow in our in our grains. So once again, it kind of goes back to grains, right? Why why is that, Dr. J? Why is it that we are our food industry, the regulations are so poor that we can't even have high enough standards that we that they have in Europe, like you said, for livestock, and we don't even match those standards for human beings when it comes to grain production? That's insane. I know. I wrote about it in my book too, because it it's it's a similar pattern with all these estrogen mimicking chemicals. It's like it's illegal in Europe, totally illegal or totally common in America. Illegal in Europe, common in America. Illegal in Europe, common in America. It's the sunscreen chemicals. It's the plastic chemicals. It's the fragrance chemicals. It's the grains. It's the mold in the grains. So that's why a lot of people go to Europe, and they eat the pasta and they feel great, and they come to America and they eat the pasta and they feel terrible. Right? It's a common story that you hear if you talk to people about their health every day, like I do. But why? Why Why are we uh, struggling so much in the U.S. with our regulations? Is it, I mean, is it an industry of food producers that don't oh. want to follow standards? Yeah, I think it's because um, there's more money corrupting politics in America, meaning like these politicians are bought off more in America than they are in Europe. Like, f for example, in Europe, I have a friend, he gave a talk on, the, on, a, on, the, uh, on a chemical that is used to spray crops with. And he talked about all the bad health problems that this chemical causes, and they made it illegal two weeks later. It was a fungicide. And in America, this is like five years ago, that chemical is still legal. It's still used. It's making companies a lot of money. So again, these companies leverage the money they make to kind of buy off these politicians. And I think that corruption is obviously altering our health. And it, it makes it more important in America to kind of fend for yourself in regards to your health, you know, just you have to be more aware, you have to be more self-educated on these topics. It's just the unfortunate burden that we have to have now, you know, just living in America. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing diaper company, and it's a pro-life diaper company too. Did you know that Huggies and Pampers and other companies actually support through their conglomerates abortion and Planned Parenthood, which is absolutely crazy? Everylife.com actually donates some of their money back to the pro-life movement, so it does exactly the opposite. Their product is also best in class. They're breathable diapers that are leak-proof, that are made of high-quality ingredients, and that are good for your little one's skin. You're going to love Everylife.com because of the mission and also because it's such a great product. Go to everylife.com today, check out their diapers and wipes, order a bundle for the little one in your life and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com. And don't forget to use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. 
Dr. J, what about the FDA? Because the FDA, yes, in a sense, is accountable to the legislature. I mean, Congress, I think, can, and administrations can make certain rules and, and uh, you know, um, executive orders that may impact the FDA. And certainly the leadership of the FDA might be appointed by, you know, a new presidential administration. But how, why would the FDA have such low standards and requirements for big food or the food industry in the United States? What's in it for them? Are they getting some kind of kickbacks? Well, first of all, FDA is Food and Drug Administration, and it should be separated, right? It's silly that there's one institution that's foods and drugs, and most of the FDA is funded by the drug companies. And remember, the big food and the big drug companies are not interested in your health. They're interested in making money. And how do you make more money in food? You sell more addictive foods like lots of sugar, lots of gluten. And by the way, gluten acts on your opioid receptors. A lot of people don't realize that gluten is like heroin. It acts on your opioid receptors. It's like morphine. It's called gluteomorphine if you want to look it up. But so the food companies are trying to addict people. And then you get the drug companies in. They're on the same team, right? Because the sicker people get, the more drugs they take. So, And then they're basically buying off the FDA by funding the FDA. So it's a problem. It's a deep seated problem. I don't know how to fix it, but I know, I, I know, I know to be extra skeptical, right? And I know how to teach people on YouTube and stuff like that and talk about it and hopefully don't get censored too much, which sometimes, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not on that. But, but I think that's the, the route people have to take is just be skeptical. I homeschool my kids, right? Uh, be self-educated and, and hopefully we can fix it. I'm not, I'm not a politician and I'm not that much of an expert on policy. So I don't know how to fix it. I mean, it's so much crazy information in this show. And I, we were just talking, I think you're going to be out in Southern California. So we've got to have you in studio and talk more about all of this. I, I am curious. I want to talk about your DNA analysis work. You do run a consulting um, business doing DNA analysis, which sounds super interesting. But before that, I am curious with all the research you've done, writing your book in 2017, which I think in a way, a lot of your work has been prophetic. I mean, the things that you're reporting on in 2017 have just gotten worse. What has been the most, two of the most surprising things that you've discovered about how uh, estrogenics are impacting our health and also the way that this is, I think, hidden from a lot of people. They're not even aware of the impact on their health of just their day-to-day -day lifestyle? Well, one of the most surprising things initially was the fact that there's birth control in the water. I learned that in college because in college, as part of our college, our college orientation, they had somebody from the municipal water supply come and give a little talk. And they told us there's birth control in our drinking water. And it was like mind bending for me. I had no idea. I was literally drinking out of the sink at that time. And it obviously completely changed my outlook on that. Um, and the sunscreen's another one, right? Because parents are constantly slapping sunscreen on their mm -hmm. kids and it's way worse than we thought. Even when I published my book, I knew it was bad, but they've done follow-up studies and they found that one application of sunscreen with oxybenzone, that's the, ke the chemical oxybenzone, one application, seven days later, your blood levels are above the government safety limit from what that one application of sunscreen. So that was worse than I thought, really surprising to me. The other thing that I know this is, you only asked me for two things, but the third thing that really surprised me was polar bears in Northern Alaska have a bunch of estrogen chemicals in their fat cells and in their bodies because it's worked up the food chain and it's gotten into the oceans and it's circulating around our globe. So there's almost nobody that's not exposed and no wildlife that's not exposed to these estrogen chemicals. It's just so pervasive. It's it's getting into remote parts of the globe. It's absolutely crazy. So sunscreen for kids, I mean, what's the solution? What do you what do you put you on your kids? You have to use zinc sunscreen, you know, like What kind of sunscreen do you If you, you can't pronounce the chemicals, probably don't use it. Yeah, I have a recommendation on my website, ajconsultingcompany.com. I have a page on there where I recommend all kinds of different products, like baby bottles and shampoos and soaps and things. And I have the sunscreen on there, but it's got to have zinc. Basically 20% zinc works great. If your body absorbs a little zinc, no big deal, right? Zinc and coconut oil, that kind of thing. Amazing. Okay. So before we wrap up, I do want to hear about your DNA analysis consulting work. Sounds really interesting. What do you actually do? What are you actually analyzing? Why should people get their DNA analyzed? 
Yeah, so I look at the 23andMe or the Ancestry.com DNA data, which, by the way, has 900,000 SNPs. I mean, it's a very thorough data set. And medical institutions are not tapping into the data because they're not that interested in preventing health issues. They're more interested in waiting until people get sick and then they give you drugs. That's the medical system. And I'm more interested in preventing the health problems from happening. So I'm looking for like heart disease risk genes that we can prevent instead of having a heart attack, let's prevent a heart attack, Alzheimer's risk. How can we prevent that, right? How can we prevent joint pain and arthritis and all kinds of that sort of thing? So really in general, my goal is just prevention. And I look at brain optimization and that includes anxiety and depression and all this sort of thing. I look at diet optimization. I look at vitamins and hormone optimization exercise optimization, which includes the joints and bone density and sleep. So it's very holistic. It's a lot. And people can find me on YouTube and actually watch me do DNA consults with actual people, for example, so they don't have to just wonder if, you know, like what it's like. You can actually watch me talk to people about this on YouTube. Awesome. And maybe we can have you in studio and you can do a DNA consult out here. I hear you're, you'll fun. be out here. Um, sounds <laughs> super fascinating. Where can people find, you mentioned your YouTube channel. We'll link it in the link it in the bio. What's your website again, Dr. J? Yep. So my YouTube is Anthony, uh, Dr. Anthony J. And then my, uh, my major website, the main website I use is AJ Consulting Company. Dot com. It's a terrible website name. I know I made it up 10 years ago or 15 <laughs> years ago, but it's ajconsultingcompany.com. Awesome. And last question, I, I, uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but where do you think based on the way things are going today, some good trends, but a lot of bad trends too, when it comes to estrogenics or health, what do you think this landscape is going to look like in 10 years in terms of population health and in the way we interact with these environmental toxins? I think it, what's happening, just like there's a lot more financial divide in this country where people are becoming poorer or richer. There's more polarity in health too, where people are becoming sicker or healthier on the extremes. There's less middle ground uh, because some people are self-educating themselves and being more aware of food and, and chemicals. And then other people are just going along with guidelines and becoming sicker. So I think it's just, there's going to be more polarity. And again, I think the people on the self-educating side, the ones that are paying attention, being skeptical about government guidelines and corruption and things, those are going to be the winners. That's my prediction mm. on this. And so in other words, it never hurts. Knowledge is power, right? Like mm. in this regard, the more you know, the better. And like Socrates said, know thyself, right? You want to know yourself. The better you know yourself, the better you can kind of work within these parameters. Well, I hope that this has given an introduction to the folks listening to have at least access to some of the tools you provide to know ourselves and to make healthier choices because it is crazy to see what has happened in the last few decades in my lifetime. And, you know, hearing even about, you know, so many, incre an increase in cancer diagnoses among so many different age groups, including younger age groups. I think it's all interconnected and I hope we can have you back and deep dive that topic too. Cause I know that's another one that's so important, but thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Fascinating stuff. I'm excited to have Dr. J back in the studio in the future to deep dive these topics and more soon. As always, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and join our Patreon community, which is at the link in the bio, and we'll see you guys next time. And a huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest Catholic network in the world, reaching millions with entertainment, news, and more. Check them out at EWTN.com.